and he gets the so-called best corporate practices. I think the people who talk about them don't really know what the best practices are. They just know what they think are the best practices. And they determine that based on the whole cell, not, not the whole work. And so I like our way of doing things better than theirs, and I hope to God we never follow their best practices. I'd like to point out one thing on independent directors. I mean, I've been on 20 public company corporate boards, not counting any Berkshire or its subsidiaries. So I've, I've seen a lot of corporate boards operate. And uh, the independent directors, in many cases, are, are, the, are the least independent. I mean, if, if the income you receive as a corporate director, which typically may be around 250000 a year now, if that's an important part of your income, and you hope that some other corporation calls the CEO and says, how's so-and-so as a director? And they, the current CEO, the, your CEO says, oh, he's fine. You know, never raises any problems. Uh, and then you get on another board at 250000 and that's an important part. How in the world is that independent? I mean, it, it's it, I really just an observation. I can't recall particularly any independent director where their income was from the board was important to them, I can't recall them ever doing anything in board meetings or committee meetings that actually was counter to the interests. You know, they put them on the cop committee. I mean, they, they're just not going to upset the apple cart because what they're, and I would, I'd probably be the same way in the same position. I mean, if 250,000 a year is important to you, why in the hell would you behave in a way that's going to cause your CEO to say to the next CEO, say, this guy acts up a little bit too much. You, you know, you really better get somebody else. It's the way it works, but they've got... I, I think it works a little worse than Warren's telling you. <laughs> yeah, Charlie and I... It's really awful. It was awful. I mean, we... And only that Warren and I are... We occupy the niche for pomposity very well ourselves. We don't need any more of it. Charlie and I were on one board. Well, I was on one board, actually, a long time ago, where uh, we owned a very significant percentage of the company. And the rest of the board was almost exclusively customers of the company, uh, but not owners. They had absolutely token holdings. And at one point, we were looking at something where a tax decision was being made in terms of the distribution of some securities. and. It was a lot of money was involved, and one of the other directors said, well, let's just swallow the tax. Well, his swallowing amounted to about $15 or something. Of the, and I said, let's parse this sentence out. Let's swallow the tax. Let's let us swallow the tax. So who wants to swallow an equal amount of, you know, to me? Uh, it's, you know, it's, you don't, you don't get invited to be on, boards if you belch too often at the dinner. Well, blue chip stamps, we had a director who said, I don't see why you guys should get be so important just because you own all the shares. Yeah. Charlie, Charlie and I used to have to cool off after the blue chip stamps meetings. Cause we, we, we and Rick Garrett owned what percent probably? Oh, uh, yeah. 50%. Yeah, 50%. And they'd appointed all these. They were all members of the Rotary Club. It came out of a government settlement or something. And, and, uh, it was not an ideal form of, of, of uh, decision making. And they just had a different calculus in their mind that they didn't. And, and I can understand it, but I'm not going to replicate it. Yeah. <laughs> At Seeds Candy, we sell directly to the consumer, but at Kraft Heinz, they're intermediaries. And the question, and those intermediaries are trying to make money. We're trying to make money. And the brand is our protection against the intermediaries make intermediaries making all the money. Costco tried to drop Coca-Cola back in, I think, 2008. And you can't drop Coca-Cola, uh, you know, and, and, and not disappoint a lot of customers. Snickers bars are the number one uh, candy. Mars makes them. And they've been number one I mean, for 30 or 40 years. And and if you walk into a, a drugstore and the guy says, I've got the Snickers is 75 cents or whatever it might be, and 
I've got this special little bar we make, my, my wife and I make in the back of the store, and it's only 50 cents, and it's just as good. You don't buy it, you know, next, when you're at the some other place the next time you buy the Snickers bar. So it, brands are can be enormously valuable, uh, but many of the brands uh, are dependent, most of them, Geico is not. Geico goes directly to the consumer. If we save the consumer money on insurance, they're gonna buy it from us. And uh, our brand, you know, and we'll spend well over a billion and a half on advertising this year. And you think, my God, we started this in 1936 and we were saying the same thing then about saving 15% in 15 minutes or something of the sort. Not exactly the same, but but it that brand is is huge. And we have to we have to come through on the promise we give, which is to to save people significant money on insurance, a great many people. That brand is huge, and we're dealing directly with the consumer. And when you're selling Kool-Aid or ketchup or, or you know, Heinz 57 sauce or something, you are going through a channel, and they would, as the phrase was used earlier today, you know, our gross margin is their opportunity, and we think, we think that the the ultimate consumer is going to force them to have our product and that we will get the gross margin. And that, that, that fight, that tension has increased in the last five years and I think it's likely to increase in the next five or 10 years. And Charlie is a director of a company that, that uh, has caused me to think a lot about that subject. You were quoted as stating that you recognize that Berkshire overpaid for Kraft Heinz. Clearly, major retail chains are being more aggressive in developing house brands. In addition, Amazon has announced intentions to launch grocery outlets, meaning that, as Mr. Bezos has often stated, your margin is my opportunity. Will traditional consumer good brands in general, and Kraft Heinz in particular, have any moat in their future? My question is, to what extent do the changing dynamics in the consumer food market change your view on the long-term potential for Kraft Heinz? Yeah, I, actually what I said was we paid too much for Heinz. Uh, I, I mean, Kraft, I'm sorry. We had to, uh, the Heinz part of the transaction, when we originally owned about half of, half of uh, uh, Heinz, uh, we paid an appropriate price there and uh, and we actually did well. We had some preferred redeemed and so on. Uh, we paid too much money uh, for Kraft. To some extent, our own actions had driven up the prices. Now, Kraft Heinz, uh, uh, the profits of that business, six billion, we'll say very, very, very roughly, I'm not checking them out, uh, I'm not making forecasts, but six billion, uh, uh, pre-tax uh, on seven billion of tangible assets it is a wonderful business, uh, but you could pay too much for a wonderful business. We bought C's candy and we made a great purchase as it turned out, and we could have paid more. But there's some price at which we could have bought even C's candy, and it wouldn't have worked. So the business does not know how much you paid for it. I mean, it's going to it's going to earn based on its fundamentals, and we paid we paid too much for the craft side of Kraft Heinz. Additionally, the profitability has basically been improved in those operations over the way they were operating before. But you're quite correct that Amazon itself has become a brand. Uh, Kirkland at Costco, the $39 billion brand. Now, all of Kraft Heinz does $26 billion, and it's been around for, on the hindsight, it's been around for 150 years. Uh, it's been advertised billions and billions of billions of dollars in terms of their products, and they go through tens of thousands of outlets. And here's somebody like Costco establishes a brand called Kirkland, and it's doing $39 billion more than virtually any food company. And... There, that brand moves from product to product, which is terrific if a brand travels. I mean, Coca-Cola moves it from Coke to Cherry Coke and Coke Zero and so on. But to have a brand that 
can really move. And Kirkland does more business than Coca-Cola does. And Kirkland Act that operates through 775 or so uh, stores, they call them warehouses at Costco, and Coca-Cola's through millions of distribution outlets. So brands, the retailer, and the brands have always struggled as to who gets the upper hand in moving a product to the consumers. And there's no question in my mind that the position of the retailer relative to the brands, which varies enormously around the world in different, in different, uh, uh, in different countries. You've had 35%, even maybe 40% be private label brands and soft drinks, and it's never gotten anywhere close to that in the United States. So it, it varies a lot, but basically retailers Certain retailers, the retail system has gained some power, and particularly in the case of Amazon and Walmart and their reaction to it, and Costco, uh, and Aldi and some others I can name, uh, has gained in power relative to brands. Kraft Heinz is still doing very well operationally, but we paid too much. We paid $50 billion, you know, the, would have been a different business. It'd still be earning the same amount. It, uh, you can you can turn any any investment into a bad deal by paying too much. What you can't do is turn any investment into a good deal by paying little, which is sort of how I started out in this world. But the idea of buying the cigar butts that have only got uh, that are declining or four businesses for a bargain price is not something that that we try to do anymore. We try to buy good businesses at a decent price, and we made a mistake. Uh, on the craft part of Kraft Heinz, Charlie? Well, we, uh, not a tragedy that out of two transactions, one worked wonderfully and the other didn't work so well. That happens. The reduction at cost, you know, there, there can always be mistakes made when you've got places and you're rearranging, reorganizing them to do more business with the, with the same number of people. And we like buying businesses that are efficient to start with, but it's the, the management, uh, the operations, of Kraft Heinz have been improved under the, the present management overall. But uh, we paid a very high price in terms of, of the Kraft part. We didn't, we paid an appropriate price in terms of Heinz. Hello, Warren and Charlie. Consumer tastes are changing. I think if we asked how many people here in the arena have eaten Belbita cheese in the last year or so, there'd be only a small handful, maybe more for Jell-O. 3G's playbook of cutting R&D looks to have stifled new product development and missed changing preferences. So here's my question. Why continue to hold when the moat appears to be dry, or do you think it is filling back up? Well, I, I don't think the problem was that they cut research or something. I think the problem was they paid a little too much for the last acquisition. Yeah, Jell-O, I, I, I can't give you the exact figure. There's certain brands, maybe declining 2% a year, 3% a year in, in, in unit sales. And there's others that are growing 1% or 2%. There's not dramatic changes taking place uh, at all. I mean, Kraft Heinz is earning more money than Kraft and Heinz were earning six or seven years ago. I mean, uh, that, that, and and the products are being used in a huge way. Now it's true that certain, that there are always trends going to some degree, but they have not fallen apart remote and they have widened the margin somewhat, but it is, it is tougher in terms of the margin and the price negotiations probably to go through the, to the, to the actual consumer. It's become a somewhat tougher passageway for all food companies. Uh, and it was 10 years ago. It's still a terrific business. I mean, you know, you mentioned Jell-O or Velveeta. Charlie works at my grandfather's grocery store in 1940. I worked there in 41. And if uh, they were buying those products, then they buy the products now. The margins are still very good. They earn terrific returns on invested capital, but we paid too much in the case of, in the case of Kraft. The, you can pay too much for a growing brand. I mean, the, 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 you can pay way too much we're growing, but probably be easier to be sucked into that. Uh, so I, I don't, I, I basically don't worry about the brands. Certain of them are very strong, um, and certain of them are de declining a bit. But that was the, that was the case ten years ago. It'll be the case ten years from now. But it's not. It's, there's nothing dramatic happening in that.